Back in 2020, I measured the distance of Wolf 359 using parallax from NASA's New Horizons probe, but now I'm going to measure the distance to Barnard Star using just my own equipment. In 2018 and 2023, I measured Barnard Star's proper motion. By measuring its position almost exactly five years apart to the day, I was able to measure its proper motion by itself without any effect from Earth's orbital motion causing parallax within the images. I've collected more observations of the star in the last few months, and if there is no parallax to be seen, then Barnard's star should continue in a straight line at a constant velocity without deviating side to side as Earth moves through its orbit. Positive parallax would manifest as the star appearing to the left of the teal line on dates prior to June 10th and to the right of the line on dates after June 11th. In order to use parallax to measure the distance of the star, we first need to know the length of our baseline, which means we need to know the distance of the Sun. In 2022, Red's rhetoric and I measured the distance of Mars and the Sun using topocentric parallax, and you can see that in a video linked in the description. For the purposes of this video, I will use my own personal determination of the distance of the Sun of about 150 million kilometers in order to determine our baseline. Knowing the distance of the Sun and the angle between two positions of the Earth on two different observing dates, I can solve for the baseline that runs directly between those positions of the Earth by using a pair of right triangles. Dividing the angle between the two positions of the Earth in half, we get angle A, and if we take the sine of this angle times the distance of the Sun, we get the baseline divided by 2. When we use this baseline to measure the distance of another star, that star is not necessarily perpendicular to our baseline, so we need to use the law of sines to solve for the triangle described by the two sight lines from the two positions of Earth and our baseline. If we consider angle B to be the separation between the previous position of the Earth and the position of the star that we're measuring, and angle P to be the parallax angle that we measured by astrometry, then we can find the distance of the star as the sine of angle B times the baseline over the sine of angle P. I collected a number of observations of Barnard's star between May and September of 2025 in order to measure its position with astrometry and detect any parallax that might be present. The teal line represents the projected proper motion of the star based on my June 2018 and 2023 observations, but the star was to the left of that line in May and to the right of that line in July, August, and September exactly as predicted based on positive parallax. I then took the observation from May and projected it out using my measurement of the proper motion to predict where it should be in each of the following observations if parallax were not a factor. The angular separation between the measured and predicted positions gives us the parallax angle between the May observation and each of the subsequent observations in July, August, and September. I then created a spreadsheet to calculate the distance of Barnard's star from these observations, and the average came out as 5.5 plus or minus 0.4 light years. The spreadsheet is linked in the video description. Space deniers and flat earthers like Austin Witsit seen here in the left during this debate will claim that parallax is simply due to a motion of the stars and that Earth is stationary and that this does not reflect their distance. Well, first of all, you assume the medium, you assume <coughs> that we're moving, and then you try to measure a difference. But if the stars were just moving, which I can cite many astrophysics will tell you a neo-tychonic system will explain retrograde and parallax is very easy. Just for the audience, if you don't understand, parallax is the movement of stars throughout the course of the year. Okay, They're claiming that that happens because the Earth is moving and the stars are not moving. Well, in reality, of course, the, the Earth, if it's stationary and the stars move around the Earth, if they were to change how they move, that would give us the same observation they're calling parallax. So why is that not possible? One reason why that isn't possible has to do with the observation I mentioned at the start of this video, my measurement of the distance of Wolf 359 using simultaneous observations from the New Horizons probe and my own telescope. These observations did not depend on Earth's motion in its orbit, and were conducted simultaneously, and yet they still showed the expected amount of parallax. But that's not all. The images I've now taken of Barnard's star contain additional evidence of Earth's orbital motion. But to show that, I needed to find another night with the same temperature as the May observation, and I found it on August 28th, with another night at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. This allowed me to control for any thermal expansion or contraction of the telescope's components when measuring the field of view on both nights and comparing them. Any spacecraft traveling closer and closer to the speed of light would see the field of view of stars appear to constrict towards its direction of travel and expanding in the opposite direction. 
This means your field of view would seem to increase as you accelerate and as you look forward towards the direction you're traveling, but the field of view would conversely appear to decrease as if you're zooming in if you looked in the opposite direction away from your direction of travel. This effect is sometimes referred to as velocity aberration. Because Earth orbits the Sun over the course of a year, a telescope's field of view will appear to slightly change when looking at a single location in the sky over months of time. As we travel around the Sun on Spaceship Earth, the field of view of a telescope will appear to become wider than normal in the green region of this chart, and appear to become more narrow as if the telescope is zooming in in the red region of the chart. The intensity of the color indicates the strength of the effect, and the magnitude of the effect depends on the initial field of view, but even at its maximum strength, it requires precise astrometry with the telescope to detect the subtle effect. Astrometry reveals that the diagonal field of view of the May 24th images was a fraction of an arc second wider than it was on August 28th. Each dot on this chart is a single one-minute exposure. But to confirm this effect, we don't need to simply observe a single field of view over months of time and hope to find two nights with the same ambient air temperature months apart. Moving the telescope from the red region of the sky, where the field of view is reduced, to the green region where the field of view is expanded, while both of these regions are above the horizon, we can confirm the effect in just a few minutes of time, while everything about the telescope remains exactly the same. On September 3rd, I conducted one final observation from Chiefland, Florida to do just that shortly after midnight. After observing Barnard's star one more time in the red region of the chart, I slewed the telescope to the opposite side of the sky, to Miroc's Ghost, a galaxy next to the star Miroc in the constellation Andromeda in the green region to the left. Everything else about the telescope remained exactly the same, including the focus, the temperature, and the focal length. As clouds approached Barnard's star in the west, I slewed the telescope over to Miroc's ghost in the east and began guiding on Miroc itself, allowing me to collect these observations of both Barnard's star and Miroc's ghost and measure their fields of view using astrometry. Astrometry revealed that the field of view was a fraction of an arc second wider when the telescope was pointed at Miroc's ghost than it was when pointed at Barnard's star on September 3rd, exactly as expected due to Earth's orbital velocity. These observations demonstrate how Earth's orbital velocity affects the field of view of the telescope due to velocity aberration. Although the effect is small and accounts for just a fraction of a pixel in my images, the effect is measurable with astrometry and statistically significant at a p-value of less than 0.01. This effect is related to stellar aberration, but once again, space deniers and flat earthers will deny that this is caused by Earth's orbital velocity. In fact, they point to Aries' water-filled telescope as evidence that Earth's orbital velocity is not the reason for stellar aberration, and I debated Alan on this on Red's Rhetoric's channel not that long ago. I gave a detailed explanation for why we don't expect a water-filled telescope to show a different amount of stellar aberration than an air-filled telescope. Go back and watch the debate if you want that whole explanation. But the bottom line is that Alan was unable to anticipate this particular ramification of stellar aberration, that is to say, velocity aberration, because I asked him about it specifically. That's kinematics. That could, that's relative motion. It could go either way. We need to introduce a manipulation of one of the variables in the equation, and the, way, the only one that we can manipulate is the speed of light by introducing water into the telescope. Well, it turns out that's not the only thing we can manipulate, but we'll get there. I'm, I'm asking you a question about what these two equations predict. These two equations predict that you will not see any stellar aberration at two points in the sky. What are those points? If you could get to the punchline, I anxiously await. I don't know. Again, this is my render of how much stellar aberration is expected throughout the sky over the course of a year playing on loop. There's two points here that are fairly neutral looking colors that are 90, 180 degrees separated, right? So if you were able to speed up the telescope, if you were able to look at a star somewhere, maybe uh, somewhere just off of the velocity vector, which is what that 90 and 270 represent, the Earth's velocity vector in its orbit, right? If you were able to, able to point your telescope somewhere along generally the velocity vector, but instead of it taking six months to get around to the other side. What if we could alter a variable so that it only takes hmm, maybe half an hour, maybe 45 minutes? What do you think we would see? 
what would we observe if you looked at a star and you looked at all the other stars right next to it in a very tight space and you could accelerate all this process up to take just about you know 30 minutes 45 minutes what would you see what would we see if we got to the point so is that is that you saying you you don't know what you would see i don't know what we would see please tell us because alan doesn't understand what causes stellar aberration he's unable to make any useful predictions about its behavior which is why he was unable to predict velocity aberration when i asked him as we've seen in these charts Velocity aberration has its highest strength 90 degrees from the sun along Earth's orbital velocity vector, where stellar aberration is at its minimum. Because I understand that stellar aberration is a consequence of Earth's orbital velocity, I was able to literally predict velocity aberration using my own planetarium software to generate these charts, and I was able to observe it myself, which is something that, to my knowledge, no other amateur astronomer has ever done. However, I am not the only astronomer to witness velocity aberration. In fact, it's routinely witnessed by a different professional telescope, as we'll get to in a minute. But I asked Alan what would happen if we changed another variable. In fact, what would happen if we altered the velocity of the telescope? And he was unable to answer the question. Likewise, I also asked Witsit in my discussion with him on Tim Pool's show what would happen if we tried to observe aberration from a different orbit, say, from the orbit of Mars, and he immediately deflected and refused to answer the question. Okay. So, Austin, my question to you is, if you had your water-filled telescope on Mars and you point at a star, will you see stellar aberration consistent with Mars's orbital motion, or will it be affected by water? If you went to Narnia, what would be your favorite color? <laughs> I, I, I don't go to Mars, and, and, and that's irrelevant. It's a deflection. No, it's it what you just did was deflect from my hypothetical, and my question was not irrelevant. In fact, we see what happens all the time when you observe the stars from a different orbit than the one we experience riding on Spaceship Earth. Hubble Space Telescope orbits the Earth every 90 minutes at 7.5 kilometers a second, and because of its incredible resolution, we can actually see velocity aberration changing over the course of just minutes of time. You can visibly see the effect in these four corners of pictures taken by Hubble only 30 minutes apart on opposite sides of its orbit. Likewise, as passengers of our own spaceship Earth, we can observe how our spaceship's 30 km per second orbit around the Sun impacts our field of view with our own telescopes on the ground. Altogether, these observations demonstrate that aberration is dependent on your orbit, in this case, our orbit around the Sun, and that we can use Earth's orbit around the Sun to measure the distance to the stars. Thanks for watching, and until next time, clear skies.